Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Eckstein Hall and Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are joined by Paul Taylor of the Pew Research Center. He is the author of this book, The Next America, Boomers, Millennials, and the Looming Generational Showdown. Won't you please give Paul Taylor a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. Good to have you here, Paul. A little bit of background on uh, Paul Taylor. Uh, he's a journalist by trade, uh, spent a, a number of years working for The Washington Post covering presidential campaigns. We were just talking presidential politics before we came in here. Uh, also uh, worked in South Africa for The Post as a foreign correspondent. Uh, he's been an executive vice president at Pew Research. He's written a couple of other books, at least. Maybe you said two and a half, I guess we could say. But this is an interesting topic, the next America. Why this book? Well, I've uh, been at the Pew Research Center for the last decade or so. We do a lot of public opinion surveys. We do a lot of demographic, economic, social research, look at a lot of data. We, we hope the data tells interesting stories. That I'm not a social scientist. I hang out with them. I'm the, the would-be storyteller. Uh, and um, it is clear that the America of the early 21st century is in the midst of a couple of profound demographic changes. And this book is an effort to tell about all these changes, social, political, racial, technological, through a generational lens. The two big changes, you know, demographic change is a drama in slow motion. It, it sort of unfolds incrementally. It unfolds tick by tock. Uh, it, it, nobody calls a press conference. An old editor of mine used to describe <laughs> stories that ooze rather than break. Nobody calls a press conference <laughs> to announce that the architecture of our families is different, that the very meaning of race has changed, that the, the arc of economic well-being has moved up the life cycle. But all these things are happening. And the two biggest and most important and distinctive to this era in our history are we are en route to becoming a majority non-white country. This will happen sometime a little bit before the middle of this century. In 1960, our population was 85 percent white. By the middle of this century, according to the Census Bureau, it will be about 43 percent white. That is a lot of change in the span of a century. It's the century we are living in. So you've got that going on. Uh, and then the other thing going on is that uh, a record share of us, uh, like me, like Mike, are going gray. Uh, and, uh, and that is happening, uh, you know, never before in human history. And a lot of that is good news. We're living longer. There, there's a lot to like about that. Birth rates are down. If you worry about the sustainability of the Earth's resources, there's a lot to like about that, too. But you put these two changes on top of each other, and what you wind up with, which is where we are today, we, we, you wind up with a moment in our history where old, old and young don't look alike, they don't think alike, they don't vote alike, they don't use technology alike, they don't form families in the same way. This has the potential. Uh, this creates generation gaps that have the potential to put stress on everything from our politics to our pocketbooks to our families to our entitlement programs to our whole sense of social cohesion. Uh, the story doesn't have to end badly. I'm a glass half full guy. I would like to believe that we will manage this transition, but this is the moment we're in and it affects uh, every realm of our society. It was interesting the way you referred to uh, the way demographics change, uh, and this probably does. Uh, uh, feel a bit more like an oozing rather than breaking. Um, but you said you had an aha moment uh, back in 2012. What was that moment for you when you realized the magnitude of what was happening? Well, I'm glad you brought up. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you two for the price of one. I'm going to give you two aha moments. I open the book with, uh, as an old political reporter, I am watching uh, election night 2012. Uh, I'm channel flipping with ABC, NBC, Fox. Uh, you know the cable networks. Uh, I used to be, you know, madly tapping out, uh, you know, reporting those things. So I'm sort of curious to see how it how it happens. So here we are. It's election night, um, 
And it's a little after 11 o'clock, and uh, well, I'm watching Fox, uh, and, and uh, Ohio comes in, uh, and uh, Fox says, that's it, uh, Obama is now, he won Ohio, he's over 270, we're calling the election uh, for Barack Obama, he's been reelected. Karl Rove is sitting next to Megyn Kelly, uh, and he throws the equivalent of, in live TV, uh, he has a, the equivalent of a mini breakdown, a meltdown. He, and, he, and, you know, and he, he says, wait, Megyn, it's a little too early. Don't, you know, I know Ohio. There are still 25% of the precincts out. Franklin County here. And um, Megyn says, you know, we have a decision desk back there, and they run these things a thousand ways, and we don't call them unless there's a 99 plus degree certainty. Anyway, some of you may remember this. What they actually did was they marched Karl Rove back to the decision desk. They opened these hermetically sealed doors, which the networks like to keep that because they don't want their numbers crunchers to be influenced by other things. And indeed, they said, sorry, Carl, this is a done deal. Now, here's what interested me. Uh, I, I know Carl Rove, uh, you know, I know people like Carl Rove. Uh, you know, from every single day up to election night, they will spin things a thousand ways from Sunday. They want to project their sense of what's going to happen. But they don't really want to be wrong at 11 o'clock on election night, because among other things, they look silly and there's no advantage to being wrong. Carl Rove, I think, didn't see this election coming. If we go back to the four years of Barack Obama's first term, we know the history, eight, nine, 10 percent unemployment. Uh, a lot of the smartest people in the Republican firmament, starting with Karl Rove, who's a very smart guy, and a lot of their own pollsters, and I think Mitt Romney himself, and the Rush Limbaugh's, and all the rest, believed that Mitt Romney was going to win. Paul they, Ryan believed that Romney yeah, was going to yeah. win. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things, and, and you know what? If you're running for re-election and who have presided over an economy that has 8, 9, and nearly 10 percent unemployment, you know, you are behind, right? Barack Obama won uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons he won is just in those four years, tick, 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 oozing, the, the demography had changed. And four years' worth of young adults had aged into the electorate, disproportionately non-white uh, and, di and, and disproportionately liberal and democratic. And to put it in, in, in the kindest terms I can, four years' worth of older adults had aged out of the electorate. They had gone off to their greater rewards. That alone shifted things. Uh, were it not for the votes of people under age 30, um, we would be in year two of the Romney-Ryan administration. There was a huge generation gap in how Americans voted in 2012, as there had been in 2008. And if you go back to, where many of you will remember, the, the tie vote election of 2000. Uh, Bush-Gore had to be settled by the Supreme Court. It was a 50-50 election. It was 50-50 among old. It was 50-50 among young. If you look at how we vote in the 80s, 90s, and early aughts, no difference between old and young. So back to the aha moment. Here we start to see a huge gap, because as this rising generation of young adults is aging into the electorate, is aging uh, into the workforce, uh, they are making their presence felt. Um, and and that, this is one reason why a lot of people thought after 2012, boy, if the Republican Party can't win that sort of election, their goose is cooked, because there's just, there's just more of that coming. There are more young adults and there are more non-whites. And the under 30s were 26 percent of the eligible electorate. They were actually only 17 percent of the voting electorate in 2012, because young adults tend to vote at lower rates than older adults. But you just project forward to 2020, and, and the so-called millennials will be 37 percent. I'm going on too much on this. But, but the point is that this is who our future is. Now, it doesn't mean that Democrats win every election. We only have to go back three or four months to see how well Republicans did across the country. But I can use these demographics to describe, you know, we talk about red states and blue states. We know that story. We can talk about red truth and blue truth. We can get our red truth from Fox and our blue truth from MSNBC. And increasingly over the last four years, we can talk about red years and blue years. So we had big Democratic victories in 2008 and 2012 and big Republican victories in 2010 and 2014. There's a word for that, and that's sort of schizophrenia. That, that seems weird. 
But what, what that really is, is the two different electorates that turn out. In presidential years, it's a bigger electorate, it's 50 percent larger, and it includes more of the, quote, next America. And that's what Rove didn't see. Uh, let, let me stop there, because uh, when I, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me briefly give you what, this happened too late for the book. My favorite aha moment in 2014, uh, and I usually show the clips, but it's, it's a compelling moment. That is not a political moment, that's a cultural moment. And it happened at the Super Bowl. And we all know that the Super Bowl in modern society, not just the biggest sporting extravaganza, but the biggest advertising platform. And for the last couple of decades, the advertisers make a big deal about the new ads that they roll out. So a year ago at the Super Bowl, somebody my age has been watching TV ads and TV ad families his whole life. I sort of know what the rules are. And the rules are, among other things, that the parents in a TV ad family uh, are supposed to be the same race and the opposite sex. That's just sort of the cultural norm. So we had three product advertisers, and you may have heard of them, Chevy, Cheerios, and Coke, about as iconic as you're going to get, rolling out their ads at the Super Bowl. And the Chevy ad is a montage of families, and the voiceover is saying, you know, what it means to be a family, you know, today's families may not look the same as they have in the past, but what it means to be a family never changes. And you see a montage of families. And in some of the families you see, and it goes by very quickly, uh, the parents are the same sex and the opposite race. And then there's the Cheerios ad, which is mommy and daddy, and we're expecting a new baby, and they're explaining that to their mocha-colored child. Mom, uh, mommy is white, daddy is black, mommy is pregnant with their next mixed-race child. And then we go to the Coke ad, which is America the Beautiful being sung in six different languages. So you hear that familiar America the Beautiful refrain, but you hear it in a bunch of different languages, and then Coke is beautiful. Product advertisers are not in the business of making political enemies. They are not in the business, uh, you know, I mean, they're not in the business of making political statements of any kind. And surely they knew if they changed the rules this way, uh, they would get a backlash. And there was a backlash, to be sure. And, and that, that Cheerios ad, they had to pull it down from YouTube because the comment stream got so ugly and all the rest. But they do their focus groups. They do their market research. And they know that this country is changing. The architecture of the families is changing. The racial makeup is changing. And they wanted to express the fact that they are a part of that. And in some ways, you know, so this is, the, this is not the leading edge of change, if you're Coke and Cheerios uh, and Chevy. This is the trailing edge of change that says, yes, this change is happening, and we want to be a part of it. And I think for older adults, I think uh, there is adjusting to be done, and I think that's part of that partly plays out in our politics, but more broadly in the culture. Let's go inside uh, the numbers of, of this more diverse uh, group of folks in our country, uh, the millennials, which is 1980, the people born after 1980. Uh, a lot of the change we see is the result of immigration, and yet immigration is, is fundamentally changed. What, I think you found that, what, one out of 10 uh, immigrants to this country is from Europe now? Which is, right. it is a very different uh, right. uh, historical trend than the one we've seen in this country. Uh, I think most people in this room probably think the story of immigration in this country is largely a story about the Hispanic population, the growing Hispanic population. But you found it's more than that. It's okay. uh, large numbers of Asian Americans coming here, uh, and, and all of them uh, trying to, to live the American dream. I want to talk about that. Um, yeah. uh, based on the research that Pew has done, are they having the same success as prior generations? Are they living the American dream? Well, let's, let, let me get to that. Let me set the, the, the numbers. Pew Research Center is all about numbers on the historical context. This is actually the modern immigration wave is the third in our country's history. And certainly Milwaukee knows the first. The, the immigration begins in this country in the mid-19th century. It begins from northern and western Europe. Germany and uh, Ireland are the two biggest sending countries. Then towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, the countries of origin moved to southern and eastern Europe. Uh, so Italy, Poland, Russia become the largest sending countries. Uh, over that 80 or so year period, uh, from the mid-19th to about 1920, we get about 32 million immigrants, nine in 10 of whom are from Europe. We have a backlash again. Immigration waves always produce backlashes. We had had enough socially, politically, economically. We basically closed our doors to immigration in the 1920s. Uh, and they stayed closed for much of the 20th century. 
Great Depression, World War II. But then in 1965, 50 years ago this year, uh, we opened them back up. We're feeling good. Our economy is expanding. And since 1965, we have had 48 million immigrants come. So 50 percent more in the last 50 years than in those first waves. Just so in absolute numbers, the biggest by far. Um, but the bigger, the bigger difference is where they come from. So just 12 percent from Europe in the modern wave, half from Latin America, about 3 in 10 from Asia. If you just go over the last five years, Asian immigrants, immigration has surpassed Latin American immigration. And given the dynamics in the sending countries, that is likely to continue. So going back to our changing racial and ethnic complexion, this immigration wave is doing what all previous immigration waves have done. It replenishes and revitalizes our economy. It keeps us young. Immigrants tend to come when they're in their 20s and 30s. Uh, they are strivers. They believe in the future. One way they express that belief in the future is have a lot of kids. So immigrants tend to have a lot of kids. So we are, if you add up, there's a phrase that uh, uh, demographers use called immigrant stock, which is the immigrants themselves and the children of immigrants. In 1960, we were just 19 percent of the country was immigrant stock. By the middle of this century, 37 percent will be immigrant stock. It's the ongoing immigration wave plus the children. That'll be our biggest number in our history. If you look at all of the growth in our workforce over the next decades, it is driven by immigrants and their children. 75 percent of the growth will be the Hispanic population alone. These Hispanics, by and large, now who are aging into the electorate and workforce are the children of the immigrants. Again, this is a 50-year-old immigration wave. So to your question, how, is, how are they doing? Listen, um, there were a lot of immigration scholars who were skeptical that the, the Hispanic immigration wave would repeat what we think of. And correctly, there's plenty of data to support it, the very successful immigrant story. People come, they don't have much, but they, you know, they, they have the American dream. They're willing to work hard. They assimilate. Uh, and their children do better than them. And, and, and here we are today. Um, uh, there's plenty of evidence that that is happening. Uh, in the current wave now. Again, this modern immigration wave is old enough that the children of immigrants, enough of them are into their adulthood that you can start to measure their educational, economic circumstances. And to, to oversimplify, uh, uh, there's basis for this, but to grossly oversimplify, the Hispanics who have come have tended to come with lower socioeconomic circumstances, less education, not well-schooled in English. Uh, so they have started at the bottom. Uh, and if you mark where their children are today, uh, they are moving toward the middle. They aren't there yet, but many of them are. That, that is an attractive march forward. On the cultural indicators, uh, uh, half of Hispanic immigrants themselves don't speak English well. 95 percent of their children speak English well. Many of them want to retain Spanish, and they have the ability through all modern te technologies to keep that. But the idea that the Spanish, you know, that, that we're going to become a, uh, we may become a more multilingual nation, but the idea that English is going to lose its hold, there's no evidence of that. The Asian immigrants, there has never been as well educated an immigrant group in our history as, as today's Asian immigrants. And we were actually talking a little bit of that. And I, uh, I, Mike was saying that the Hmong group here uh, is, is, is well represented in Milwaukee. And the Hmong group, uh, actually, among Asian immigrants, is a little bit of an outlier. Uh, it's fairly small. By far, the biggest sending countries from Asia uh, are China, India, uh, Korea. Uh, Philippines, uh, the level uh, of education, they either come uh, to, to get the college and graduate education, or they come already having the college education. We, so 60 percent of all recent Asian immigrants uh, already have a BA when they get here. Uh, and they are filling up uh, those jobs in a knowledge-based economy, the so-called STEM jobs, science and engineering and, and the medical profession. Uh, where, and again, uh, I apologize for the uh, oversimplification. One of the things that's happened in a global economy, and people worry about this, is, is the middle is, is the middle class jobs have taken a hit. Uh, we still need service jobs uh, at the, for you know l lower income, lower pay. We and and the industries that need the highly skilled, highly educated jobs, those are still expanding. And in some ways, our modern immigration wave have fed have fed the need for the service economy. Somebody has to make the bed. Somebody has to slaughter the meat. Somebody has to pick the grapes. And somebody has to do the scientific work and the engineering. Um, and, and somebody 
has to create the economic activity uh, to pay for the benefits that we have promised to oldsters like me as we cross the threshold into old age. And, and our Social Security system only works if we have a vibrant and growing economy. So in that regard, immigration is doing for this country today, warts and all, uh, difficulties and all, and we can talk about the one quarter of immigrants who are here illegally. Obviously, that is a huge policy problem, and our dysfunctional Washington hasn't been able to get, a, get its mind around it. But in terms of replenishing our economy and making, and making us a diverse country in ways that my sense is will hold us in very good stead in a diverse world, uh, immigrants continue to be the gift that keeps on giving. So let's talk a little bit more, too, about another component of our, I guess you could call it our, our racial mosaic in, in this country, African Americans. Pew has done a lot of uh, studies, research, data collecting. Uh, how are African Americans faring in this next America? Uh, the picture is mixed. Uh, 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 so if you want to go back, let's say, 50 years, we, we just celebrated the 50th year of the uh, uh, of, of key civil rights legislation passing. We had the movie Selma commemorating some of that. So that's a, a pretty uh, useful starting point. Uh, you have a black community where uh, some aspects, some parts of it have done very well, have taken advantage of, of finally being unshackled uh, by Jim Crow and segregation and all the rest. And frankly, you have a, a, a portion of the black community that is not doing well uh, and uh, has been sort of stuck at the bottom. Um, so uh, two ways of describing uh, African-American well-being. If you look at well, if you, if you look at, if you look at uh, household income, African-American versus white, um, it's at about two-thirds. And it has stayed at about two-thirds for several decades now. It doesn't, it doesn't blip up that much or more. If you look at wealth, which in so, household wealth, which in some ways is a better and more profound measure of our overall economic well-being. So your wealth is everything you own, your house, your car, uh, et cetera, minus everything you owe, your mortgage, the, your debts, and everything else. Um, that gap between blacks and whites has gotten much larger. Um, and uh, about a third of all blacks have negative net wealth. And they are, they are living very marginal lives. Uh, when you have, ne you know, if you don't have wealth and something happens, you lose a job, you, you get sick, you don't have insurance, things spiral down. So there are a lot of economic challenges for a significant portion of the African American community. The other thing I would say about uh, the African American community is, on a lot of attitudinal data, uh, I, I don't want to sound like kumbaya, I want to say, uh, everything is great. We had, we had sort of a, a national kumbaya moment on race when Barack Obama was first elected. I, I know this from data. I think that stunned a lot of white people, and I think it stunned a lot of black people. Who would have thunk in our lifetimes, given who we are and who we've been, we were ready for this. We were ready for this, and we actually did that as a society without you know, without any notable disruptions. And I think it does say something good and decent about who we are. Um, but that doesn't mean that a lot of the underlying issues have gone away. And you only, we've had, we, we, we've had the last six months now with Ferguson and two or three other, uh, you know, episodes. Uh, the, the sense of uh, being, still being an other, still being discriminated against, uh, persists within the African American community. It is lower on most indicators than it used to be. Uh, it, it, there's less of a sense of discrimination in jobs and, and education. The, the, worst, uh, the worst sore point within the African American community is the criminal justice system and has been for a long time. Combination of policing and the court system, the feeling that the system is rigged against African Americans. Some whites believe that, you know, you ask, it depends on how you question, uh, are these systems fair to, uh, you know, uh, blacks and whites? And, uh, you know, about 20 or 25 percent of whites will say, no, we're, we, we still have a problem with African Americans. 70, 80 percent of African Americans uh, will say that. So we ain't there yet. Um, but I do believe that what's interesting, uh, what's interesting is that the very meaning of race uh, and the very boundaries of race have changed, in part because, you know, again, you go back to the middle of the last century and we are a mostly white country with some blacks, and that's who we were and that's who we've been for, you know, three, four hundred years, and those were the boundaries we described and those were the, you know, the one-drop rule and how we define people and everything else. Now we are, a, we are more of a rainbow, and we have Hispanics, and we have Asians, and we have something else, which is intermarriage. 
So uh, <coughs> you have a chapter here called Hapa Nation, which uh, Hapa yeah. is a term they use in Hawaii to yeah. describe people who are of mixed ancestry. So when Barack Obama's parents were married and Barack Obama was born, and, and as I like to say, let's stipulate, not to start an argument, these events happened in Hawaii and not in Kenya. <laughs> Uh, the year was uh, 1961, and looking at census data, our best guess is that that year, something on the order of magnitude of one-tenth of one percent of all weddings were like that wedding between a black person and a white person. It was still, that wedding was still illegal in 16 states. It was a gasp-inducing taboo everywhere else. And about two, two and a half percent of all weddings that year in the United States were across the lines of race and ethnicity that we use, uh, Asian, uh, Hispanic, et cetera. Fast forward to today, and 16 percent uh, of all weddings are across lines of race and ethnicity. And these, uh, and this has led uh, 17 percent of all blacks marry out. 28 percent of all Asians, 26 percent of all Hispanics marry out. About 9 or 10 percent of whites do so. So these marriages are producing kids. And what are we going to call these kids? And what are they going to call themselves? And do these, old, do these old categories still make sense? We struggle with that as a nation. The Census Bureau, every 10 years, has to come up with new rules about uh, what to call people. I, you know, I, I was a correspondent in South Africa uh, during the transition from apartheid to democracy. South Africa took racial categorization to infamously pathological extremes. They had something called the pencil test. So you would come in, and the census taker would place a pencil in your hair to test its kinkiness. And if the pencil stood straight up, you were black. And if it tilted, you were colored, which, which meant you had fewer rights. And if it fell out, you were something else. We, 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 we had things, if you go back in our history, the instructions we gave to our census takers, we had phrases like octoroon and quadroon. We, we wrote the one-drop rule into our, our, our census taking. If you're not all white, you're not white at all, which was kind of a wink. And we kind of know from Thomas Jefferson forward that it was never quite that clear. And it's less and less clear now. And from my point of view, this is a, this is a good sort of challenge. But, but the, the very meaning of race uh, is changing, and, and the kids don't, today's young adults don't see. I, uh, let me finish. I'm, I'm talking too long, but let, let me finish with an anecdote. I was giving a talk like this, and somebody comes up to me after the talk is over. He's a little bit younger than me. He's a white guy. And, and he said, you know, you're so right about race, and the kids don't have a different idea of what race is all about. He said, I was visiting my daughter at college, and I get there, and she's, she wasn't in her dorm room. I find her at the cafeteria, and she's sitting around with eight or ten of our, her friends having lunch. And, uh, you know, like, black kids, Hispanic kids, Asian kids, and it was a cool scene. And she introduced me around. And then we leave and we head back to her dorm. And I say to her, boy, that's a regular United Nations you got there for your friends. And she looked at me and said, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> be, be, you know, be, you know uh, because he sees it through that prism. And increasingly, uh, younger adults, you know, the, the boundaries are, are, are more permeable. Doesn't mean it's going away. Race is never going away. It's hardwired. What it, and you know, Mike and I were talking, and Mike showed me uh, showed me uh, uh, your your political and racial uh, where people live in the Milwaukee area, and it ain't going away here, you know, at the moment. But I do think that's where that's where the country is going. Let's talk a, a bit more about the, this millennial generation. So, um, besides looking different. Um, they're doing some things that are, are very different. I mean, you and I, when we probably, when we completed college, we, the thought never occurred to, to go back home and live with mom and dad. But the millennials are doing that, and they're doing that in big numbers. I was struck by a number, 18 to 31-year-old men. How many of them are living at home with their parents? Well, either currently or, or have at some point boomerang back more than 40 percent, uh, at some point boomerang back. And, and they're, are, they're doing this. Largely because of economics, aren't largely they? Largely because, you know, there are some cultures, uh, Southern Europe, Italy comes to mind, where this, is, this has been a cultural norm. The young men, uh, you know, Mam Mamoni is mama's boy and Bambocioni is big baby. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, that hasn't been a cultural norm here. 
but it, it has changed in the last decade or so as young adults are coming of age. And I think it has almost everything to do with the difficult economic hand that they have dealt. So it's been very hard to get started. Again, the economy is finally loosening up, but we know the story of the last six or eight years in terms of high unemployment, difficulty getting started. This generation on any economic indicator you want to look at, uh, employment, unemployment, wealth, debt, uh, poverty, um, and you do an apples to apples comparison with older adults back when they were the age that younger adults are now, and this is the first generation in our history, at least so far, and we're talking about kids now in their 20s and early 30s, that are doing worse than, than their parents were at the same stage of the life cycle. So if you get out of school, and, you, and the, other, the other thing that's happened to this generation is, at least in their 20s, they're not getting married. So uh, young adults today in their 20s, only about 25% of them are currently married. Uh, their parents' generation, 50% in their 20s were married. Their grandparents' generation, nearly 75%. Again, it's economic. Why don't they get married, we ask? Uh, well, uh, look at me. I don't have a job. I don't have a career. I got an unpaid internship. I don't have an economic foundation. Yes, I expect to marry one day. I'm not good marriage material. So where, what do you then do? Well. Hanging out with mom and dad, it ain't all bad, right? The refrigerator is usually stocked, and you don't have to put coins in the washing machine. And one of the nice things we found, expecting to find tension or stigma, uh, we found very little. They uh, like their parents. They, I, as I say, they have they a lot, and the parents like them. Uh, and they have migrated uh, from being uh, the children of their parents to being the roommates of their parents. And they, uh, and they text each other, you know, dude, what's for breakfast? You know, uh, uh, the, the kids take care of the family electronics, you know. Uh, 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 um, and um, uh, now, so, do we think, you know, what, is, what does that tell us? I don't, you know, uh, I'm one who believes, and I suspect most people believe, the institution of marriage has been around for something like 5,000 years. It's been around in every culture, uh, you know, in every society in human history, and it's been a pretty successful institution. Uh, so will these kids never marry, or will they marry at lower rates, and what does that do to the way we have children? <coughs> Uh, in 1960, five percent of children in the United States were born out of wedlock, were born to a single mother. Today, 41 percent of children are born to a single mother. A lot of this is that 20 and 30-something group that isn't marrying, but some of them are having kids. Uh, we all know the economic, you know, if you're raised in a single-parent household, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of parents, a lot of kids who do enormously well, but it is an uphill struggle economically and other things. You're more likely to be in poverty and all the rest. And we've gone from a society where it used to be when we passed Social Security 80 years ago, uh, we did it because our poorest Americans were older Americans. Today our poorest Americans are younger Americans, and again, it's, some of it is the change in the global economy and everything else. Some of it is the change in the family architecture and the circumstances that these kids are being born into and being raised into. But to end even this on a happy note, um, if you look at a lot, and, and so a lot of people would say, boy, if, we're, if we, all these kids are being born out of wedlock, we have a social catastrophe on our hands. We, we, we know the correlations with, with bad outcomes, with growing up in poverty and all the rest. <laughs> I, I have a slide here which I show in a presentation. Let's look at a half dozen different indicators, important indicators for teenage uh, outcomes and well-being. And let's compare where Americans teenagers were in 1993 or 94 versus today. So a 20-year span, and remember the teenagers 20 years ago were more likely to be born into nuclear families, two-parent families with better economic circumstances compared to today's. And what's happened to youth crime? It's down 40%. What's happened to high school dropout rates? It's down 45%. What's happened to birth to teenage girls? It's down 50%. Smoking down, drinking down. Um, so, so this goes to who these kids are. This goes to the resilience and adaptability of the families that are raising them, often in difficult circumstances. It is a reminder that warts and problems and all we are a pretty tough society, and it, it is, there's something about these kids. Somebody, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, somebody <laughs> put the title of, of that set of indicators: "Kids Gone Mild." You know, they they, they have. 
it's surprising because we always we always bitch about kids today, and we always see you know, when they do bad stuff, and kids always do bad stuff. A lot of these kids are doing good stuff, uh, and they are playing by the rules. They are not, you know, given their difficult economic circumstances, they are not angry and aggrieved. I They're grew optimistic. Are they? They are optimistic and aspirational. Yeah. I grew up, you know, in, in a cohort that came of age in the Roaring Sixties. I didn't have to look for a job when I got out of college. The job came looking for me. That was the way it was. We had a sense of grievance culturally against our parents and grandparents in terms of civil rights and women's rights and anti-war and all the rest. Uh, these kids do not have a sense of grievance. They don't even know, I think, that you know how lousy their economic circumstances are. They think it's going to all work out, and to get to, uh, and and it could be because they're young and stupid. But we were all young and stupid, right? Uh, I think a lot of it is is this is this is this thing that is just so unbelievably empowering. So, uh, so I'm, you know, I, I used to spend 25 years as a newspaper reporter, I, and I, I were worried every single day about getting information, getting it in a timely way, getting it on deadlines. So it still astonishes me. It, you know, now I can hit three clicks, and I have access basically to the sum of all human knowledge, and that is absolutely astonishing. Although, frankly. Nowadays, if it takes me the third click, I'm thinking, what is taking so long, right? <laughs> For these kids, it is not astonishing. It's the only world they've ever known. And it is not only their indispensable platform for information acquisition, it is their indispensable platform for social interaction. And somebody, this goes to their optimism, uh, uh, somebody more clever than me described this generation as the first modern pre-Copernican generation, because the universe really can revolve around them, because <laughs> they, they, can, they can interact with people, and they can build their own tribe. So they can find people they went to high school with, or find people they play fantasy football with, or find the thousand other things that they care about. And they are part of that tribe, because they, 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 and, and they put themselves in the center of it. And of course, they take pictures and selfies of themselves, and, and think, think how in power, you know, the word selfie only came into being a couple of years ago. It's, it's a, think how empowering that is. If you if you have a cat that can play the piano and you get a picture of it, you know maybe maybe ten people will look at it, but maybe a hundred or maybe a million people will look at it. And there's there's something about the sense of yes, it's all going to work out uh, that I think is very attractive about this generation. I think some of it is is their parents, uh, everybody gets a trophy, you know, you know uh, there, there has been a, you know, the, and the helicopter parenting which sort of comes into play. I think the generation a little older than them, we, we remember we talked about uh, latchkey kids, I think that generation, the so-called Xers, were a little bit lost in some of the divorce revolution and other things. But this has been a very child and child-centric and nurturing parenting norm. I think, frankly, some some folks at universities and employers feel like they have to detoxify these kids a little bit because they, they, you know they, they're a little bit overcharged in how fast they think they should be advancing and all the rest. But you know, at the end of the day, optimism is a good thing and it is often a self-fulfilling thing. So, so we'll move from optimism to, to something serious for the millennials to worry about, and that's the fact that every day, according to your book, every day, 10,000 people, just like me, retire at the age of, well, I'm not 65, but at 65, 10,000 a day. And that's gonna continue until, what, 2030? Right. So, you know, you'd look at their, their comparable size generations. You've got about 76 million boomers. You've got 80 million millennials. And you'd think, well, okay, well, maybe we're okay for the future. But you're saying, in the conclusion of your book, a chapter he calls The Reckoning, that, that we're going to have to figure some things out because the math doesn't work right. anymore. So th this, goes, this goes to the, a, a particular challenge. There's a broader challenge of, of skewing our, our spending priorities. We've always been very good as a society in investing in the future. Um, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, uh, societies become great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit under. And we are all the inheritors of that instinct in our national life, from the Intercontinental Railroad to the interstate highway system to the internet to the Erie Canal to the Hoover Dam to uh, land-grant colleges, GI Bill. We have been good as a society in investing in the future. We are doing less of those big things today. One reason we are doing less of those big things today is we made a commitment 80 years ago, we're at the 80th anniversary of, of, this, of the Social Security, 
uh, to create uh, a floor of dignity uh, for older Americans. Social Security and then the follow-on Medicare, which is 50 years old this year, have been the most successful programs, the domestic programs in American history. We ask, when we ask people, uh, are Social Security and Medicare good for America? We get 90% of older people saying yes, and we get 90% of younger people saying yes. We're in the survey business. We don't see a lot of 90s. We kid around the office. We, we sort of suspect that if we asked people, does your mother love you, we wouldn't get a 90. <laughs> so <laughs> so th they have passed the test of, of political, uh, you know, uh, of uh, summa cum laude graduates in terms of political support. Now, what's particularly interesting is that the math of these programs doesn't work, and everybody knows that. When I say everybody, uh, let's put it in quotes. Certainly everybody in Washington knows it. Certainly everybody who runs the, does the bean counting knows it. And you know who else knows it is the millennials. So when we ask young adults, do you think Social Security uh, will be there for you, at, you know, when you're ready to retire? And we gave three options. Not at all, uh, yes, but at reduced levels, or yes, at current levels. So we get 50% we get saying not at all. We get 40% saying yes, but at reduced levels. We just 6% just of millennials think these programs will be there for them when they're ready to retire. And yet still, millennials have an 85 or 90% approval rating for it. Which is, which is both an indication of how successful, you know, without Social Security, half of our seniors would be poor. Because of Social Security, uh, only about 12 or 13% of their seniors are poor. They've gone from the poorest group in America uh, to, to the most well-off. Doesn't mean every senior is floating in luxury, but the notion of building a floor, we've done that and we've done it well. Unfortunately, because 10,000 ba you know, baby boomers are retiring every single day, and this big pig in a python generation, which was a huge, they call us the baby boomers for a reason. There was a huge demographic bubble right after World War II, where the GIs came home, we won the war, let's be happy, let's make babies, let's move out to the suburbs. That's what America, that's what happened in America in the 50s and 60s. And it's been a pig and a python generation. They had to build a lot of schools for us back then. Well, here we are now transitioning from being in the workforce to being uh, retirees. And although one of the reasons for the popularity of these programs is Franklin Delano Roosevelt has the wisdom to sell them not as uh, in, 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 the dole, as it was called back then. They, they, these are not poverty programs. These are earned benefits. You, through your working life, pay in, and your employer pays in, and we all see that in our paychecks our whole lives. That's my money, and of course, uh, I have a claim on that when I get back. Unfortunately, the, the, the accounting is more complicated than that, and, and, and it's a hybrid, and basically what it is is today's taxpayers pay into a system to support today's retirees. So the ratio of taxpayers to retirees becomes very important. And it used to be 10 to 1, 8 to 1, 7 to 1, 5, and it's now a 3 to 1, and by the time all these boomers cross the threshold, it'll be 2 to 1, and at that point, the math simply doesn't work. And, and, and the, tr the Social Security has bean counters. They are public trustees. They're appointed by Democrats, Republicans. They do, a, they do an annual report every year to the Congress, to the President, the American public, and they say, hey, guys, we're going to hit a wall, uh, and by, it's about 15 years from now, uh, we can't pay our promised benefits. Uh, and the longer you wait to fix them, the deeper the hole becomes and the more the burden of any solution, whether it's higher taxes, whether it's reduced benefits, whether it's uh, higher retirement age. There are a lot of different ways to take this on. But the longer we wait, the harder it will be to fix and the more draconian the fix will have to be. Doesn't it make sense to do this now? And the answer, of course, is of course it makes sense. And if you gave truth serum to 535 members of Congress, 500 of them would say, of course we have to do it right now. They have very different opinions about what to do. But the trouble here is, and we know that the place is paralyzed and gridlocked, the trouble is that the, if you let this go, the status quo just screws. Every single day you don't do this, you're screwing the next generation because they're already, uh, they're already on path to get the worst deal from these programs. The finance of these programs is these kids today, low-income people, pay their first dollars. You know, 62% of Americans who work pay more in Social Security taxes than they pay in income taxes. So these programs have sort of been regressive at the taxing level, but progressive at the benefits level. And that's been part of the political genius. 
You're going to wind up with the regressive tax going forward, but you're, these kids, this next generation, is not going to get the benefits. So they have economic problems now. Just wait 10, 15, 20 years down the road. It seems to me that any decent society uh, takes that on and takes it on sooner rather than later. Uh, unfortunately, we, you know, Washington, D.C. has trouble doing easy things these days. This is not an easy thing, but it is a necessary thing. One brief final question, then we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. So that's the challenge, but the good news is, and, and you point this out at, at the end of the book, Paul, the, the good news is that we're actually in better shape than some of our, I guess, economic peers around the world. We're doing, we have more things going for us than Japan or Germany or Italy or China. We're not in that bad a shape, as you said, the, the American dream is, is not dead. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I mean, we, we have some demographic challenges of the kind I've just described. But demographically, if you just look at that, if you, if you look at the age structure, we have far and away the most attractive demographics of any of the world's largest economies. Uh, uh, we are currently, uh, and one way to describe that is simply median age. We're, gonna, we're getting older be, uh, be, because the boomers are, are moving into old age. So our median age today of our full population is 37. It, it will be 20 or 30 years from now, 41. Japan's will be 53. Germany's will be 52, China's will be 47. China had a one-child policy. They're going to they're gonna reap the distortions from that. Japan, people have almost entirely stopped having babies. In Germany, deaths have exceeded births every year for the last 40 years. The, a lot of these trouble uh, uh, cultures have trouble accepting immigrants. They don't have the culture that we have had of opening themselves up to immigrants. It is immigration that keeps us young, the combination of the immigrants themselves, as I said before, and the kids. So if you look at it just through demographics, anybody would look at that uh, a playing board and say, I choose America. If you look all over the world, now, will immigration continue? Uh, you know, Gallup does surveys. We do surveys all over the world. It's something like 17% of the world's population. So what is that, a billion or so people? Uh, when they're asked a question all over the world, if you, if, you, if you could move, would you like to move? Would you like to settle somewhere else? Uh, and a billion people say yes. Where would you like to go? Believe it or not, warts and all, we are still far and away. 24% of the people who say they want to move say they want to come to the United States. Um, so there is some magic here that we've always had between our, our entrepreneurship, our, our you know, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal. Uh, we haven't always lived up to those ideals, but they are still, they still remain a magnet for strivers all over the world, uh, and they will help us uh, with these demographic challenges. Let me take just a couple of questions from the audience in our remaining time. You had your hand up so fast, I've got to call on you. Wait a second for uh, Ryan to bring a microphone over for you. Okay. Thank you. How, uh, how does climate change fit in this? It seems to me that if there's any resentment to be had by a younger generation, our not being able to deal with that now is certainly going to be a cause for resentment. You know, it's a really interesting question, uh, and I speak as a boomer, where I think the first Earth Day was in 1970, just as the boomer <laughs> generation was coming of age, and one of the causes was, was the Green Revolution, was that. <clears throat> We can see some differences uh, in attitudes about climate change by generation, but they, they don't leap out at you. What's happened to the climate change issue in the last decade or more is that it has become enormously polarized. Um, uh, so uh, literally, is climate change happening and, and is man responsible for climate change? You get huge gaps on that between Democrats and Republicans, and some of that plays out within the millennial generation. So I think the notion that the notion of stewardship, the, the notion of one of the things every generation needs to do is to make sure that the earth that we inherited is in at least as good a shape, uh, I think that runs up and down the age spectrum, but is not is not sharper among the young than it is among the old. The divisions of partisan divisions on that are much bigger. Let me uh, take a question from a millennial. Yeah, hang on, let's go right up here to, to this gentleman. In terms of presidential um, 2016 questions, uh, I wanted to get your opinion on if it's Clinton uh, <laughs> v versus Bush, uh, what do you think the millennial involvement will be in that particular matchup? That's a great question. That's a good question, yeah. Uh, well, he, 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 here's one thing we, we do know, that uh, millennials, if, if you capture their imagination as Barack Obama did twice, 
they will come out and, 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 and they make a big difference. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, think, I think if it's Clinton uh, versus Bush, Mike and I were talking about this before, this will be the seventh election since 1980 that a Bush has been on a national ticket and the third that a Clinton has been on a national ticket. And you have to sort of ask yourself, is this an election or is this a rerun? Um, and um, I would, uh, look, I'm not in the business of making pre predictions, but I'll give you a one-liner that I've heard and, and I like. Uh, I think that uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, who knows what can happen, but at the moment she looks like the presumptive Democratic nominee. I think that not being the freshest face, Barack Obama had a line a month or two ago that is right, it's true. Americans like new car smell. Whatever else Hillary is or isn't, she's not new car smell, right? Uh, but I think given her political policies, she has a better chance of doing what Barack Obama was able to do, which is appeal to this younger generation that is, even though it doesn't choose to identify as Democrats, they're a very independent group, we know their voting behavior, and, and they are liberal. They believe in government. Uh, you know, they, they are liberal on, on the, the, the social and cultural issues of the day. So just through that analysis, you would have to say Hillary is likely to have an advantage over a Republican challenger. But if a Republican challenger, uh, you know, opponent comes along who is more new car smell, maybe that advantage uh, gets, uh, you know, uh, gets neutralized. Jeb Bush is not new car smell. So, uh, the, and back to my one-liner, if you do that matchup, I don't know who wins that, but I would rather be uh, the first woman than the third Bush. <laughs> Time, time for one more question. Let me see. Let me go back up here to this gentleman. If you could just hang on until we can get you the microphone. Yeah, right back there. Thanks very much. And this will be the final question. Go ahead, thanks. So you talk really well about culture and politics with younger generations. And if you could prognosticate, what would you say their next 10 to 15 years look like as far as the kind of big economic decisions that prior generations have made? So what are they going to do when it comes to home ownership and um, you know, retail spending and all the other things if their economy looks a lot different or if they think about the economy a lot different than, than previous generations? Thank you. Yes, yeah, a great question. Uh, I'm going to tread lightly on it. Uh, here's what we know so far. Again, this is, a, this is a cohort that's in its 20s and early 30s, and they're not buying houses and they're not buying cars, and both of those injuries have certainly noticed that, and they worry about that a lot. Uh, so what happens going forward? Do these, do these life passages that somebody my age is accustomed to, you get, you, you get out of school, you find a career, you, you, you get married, you have kids, is that going to happen for these young adults but just happen at a little bit later stage or, or not? I don't know the answer to that question. I have a feeling if you had a guess, yes, it will happen, but not quite at the same levels. Uh, the fastest growing family, uh, the fastest growing household type in America today is the single person household. The second fastest household type in America today is the multi generational family household, the, 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 you know, uh, several adult generations. The typical, what somebody my age thought of as the typical American household, mom, dad, and the kids living under the same roof, is not typical anymore. Among kids raised today, uh, fewer than half live in such households. So, I, I don't know that. In terms of their economic behaviors, there is a risk aversion uh, that, that is noticeable. You know, one reason they don't buy houses and cars is they don't have the money. Uh, another reason is that, you know, you think of a 30-year-old today and you think of when he or she gets out of school and, you know, foreclosure crisis, the economy, you know, goes into a huge tailspin. Um, there is also, you see this in the psychological dimensions of this uh, group of young adults. They don't trust, they don't trust institutions. They don't actually even trust other human beings. I, you know, uh, it's an interesting mix of attitudes because <clears throat> they are a place nicely in a collaborative group, but there is a wariness that they bring to a lot of their social and I think financial transactions. Um, Fidelity and some of the, and Vanguard, some of the companies that manage these big 401k programs, 
are able to look at the investment portfolios of people up and down the age cohort and, you know, the advice they give to young people just starting out who are in a 401k is, you know, you can be a little bit more aggressive with your investments. You've got 40 years and, you know, yes, there'll be bumps up and down, but, but uh, stocks tend to do better over time than bonds. So you, probably all of us have heard some version of that. Th this generation in those kinds of choices is kind of got a, a Ben Franklin quality to it. They're, they are, they don't want to take on debt. They, they're a little bit risk averse. Now that may be, that may be a good thing in terms of being prudent. Uh, you know, we are a fast moving entrepreneurial, innovative culture where trust is sort of the, uh, is sort of the grease that keeps the gears from grinding. And you, you at some point, <coughs> You want a generation that will, uh, that, that will be willing to invest. But, but let me close on this. All those attributes are true, but <clears throat> think about another aspect of the economy that has come on big just in the last half dozen years. Uh, Airbnb, Uber, um, all sorts of the, the so-called share economy, which are built on trust, right? I mean, I mean you're going to get into a cab and it's not regulated and you want to make sure it'd be nice to know if that person wasn't an axe murderer or you're going to you're going to you're going to go uh, rent out your apartment to a perfect stranger uh, but but again these, these young adults you know they they may not trust institutions they may not trust other people it seems to me they trust algorithms uh, so we have a, we have a kind of a reputation economy and eBay started this 20 years ago and sellers get rated and buyers get rated and the all, information is all out there and I trust search I trust my own uh, research. Uh, so I, I'm doing a little bit of filibustering because I don't know what kind of economic actors they are going to be. But I suspect uh, because of their different relationship to everything because of technology, they will be different in ways perhaps that we can't even imagine. Because I'm not sure we can imagine what the next economy looks like. These new relationships that are, that are empowered by the, the new markets you create, what are they going to look like five or ten years from now? I don't have a clue. A lot of questions. We're going we're gonna to wrap things up there. I want to thank everybody who came here today to be with us uh, for their attention and their interest. Most of all, I want to thank Paul Taylor. The name of the book is The Next America, Boomers, Millennials, and the Looming Generational Showdown. Thanks very much for being with us. You at home. We'll see you next time on The Issues.